Thank you so much, David. Yes, indeed. I was wondering whether it was just me, but I had a quick look at the chat and uh, <laughs> it seems uh, that it is interesting. So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, depending on where you are. My name is Esther Schrager van Luyt and I'm a specialist master in security architecture at Deloitte. Um, I have been coming and speaking at COSAC for the last six years, so I'm very happy to also be part of this virtual COSAC Connect. Um, and I'm also a director on the board of trustees for the SAPSA Institute. Um, so I, uh, I get to speak to some of you uh, quite often, fortunately. Um, and tonight I am very happy to present on a topic which I, I quite, find quite interesting. This is baking, of course. It's not about SAPSA, it's really about baking. Um, but today we'll be exploring the story of how enterprise security architects turn into bakers. And hopefully it will be an educative journey for us all. Um, so um, maybe to set some expectations before we start, what this presentation is and what this presentation isn't. Um, so this presentation came about because I was looking for a way to write my SAPSA exam papers. And um, what I have done is I have built my answers around a very simple case study. I will say a little bit more about that later. Um, but the idea is that it is very, very simplified. It is easy to understand for everybody. And it is something that we can have fun with. Um, so, and it's also an example of how we can break down complex information. So you will see quite a lot of tables tonight. I'm very sorry for this. You know, most, most of you know um, from my previous COSA presentations that actually uh, I like to work with images a lot, um, but now there's actually text and tables. Um, but it's not really about the tables. It's more, I want to take you through my thought process of how I try to imply um, some of the things, the elements in the SAPSA RMP process. Um, and it's also really me trying things out to see whether they work. Um, so I'm not saying everything in this presentation is the perfect way to do SAPSA RMP. Um, but I, I try to do my best and uh, make it an interesting case study. So what this presentation isn't, it is not official SAPSA material. And it is not something that you should just copy and paste. I really looked at the case study I had invented for myself and then tried to figure out what means could go with um, applying the process to it in a way that worked for this case study. If you have a different company, I urge you to apply some of that design thinking and really find out what they need in order to do their security well. Uh, I just hope to show tonight that, that um, what I've done works for this case study. And also, not to disappoint you, we are not going to cover everything in the 40 minutes that I am allotted. When I started building this presentation, I quickly realized I have way too much information. Um, so today we'll be doing part of the SAPSA RMP. Um, and I will, um, if you are interested in this, offer the opportunity to go through the rest of the phases at a later stage. So see this as a bit of a teaser, I think. <laughs> um, so why do we need essay bakery? Well, I'm calling it essay bakery. I think in, in writing, it looks a bit more sensible because you might have noticed that I've tried to put SAPSA into there, um, but it's a bit of a struggle when you try to pronounce it. So let's, let's go with essay bakery. Um, the reason why I first needed SA Bakery was because real organizations are really complex. And this is also something that I have struggled with throughout my SAPSA journey. Um, and when trying to apply SAPSA to the clients that I work for at Deloitte, um, because I found out that when you start from the top, uh, <laughs> and you start with the context, um, it's still fine. And as you drill down through the layers, um, it complexity increases and it becomes so difficult to model everything you want to model. And you end up with well, diagrams looking like this, but possibly worse, uh, with a lot of boxes and a lot of lines crossing each other, um, which are still relatively fine for architects because somehow we've managed to deal with it. Um, but then when you show this to a customer in the business, they freak out. So today is also an exercise in um, not only applying SAPSA to a simple case, but also trying to visualize it as simply as possible. Um, those of you who've seen me speak at COSEC before know I have a thing for visual design. This is also what my COSEC 
well, one of my COSEC presentations was to be about this year. Um, and the other one was actually about a board game um, that we are developing, which will be based on this scenario as well. So I am, I am at some point, I saw the benefit of, I am going to develop a board game for security architecture anyway. Um, so I might as well use the case I'm using for a base of that as part of my exam paper. Um, and the reason, so I felt it was really complex to apply SAPSA, but I could only imagine people starting out in their SAPSA journey, right? Um, so even if you do the trainings and you get all the super interesting information that you get from the foundation training and the follow-up trainings, um, and then you need to go back and apply it. And most of the organizations that you people work in are quite complex, quite big, and it can be very daunting to, to go and apply such a process to it, unless you cut it up into maybe, I don't know, really small chunks. Um, but I figured that it would be great to have something for, I wouldn't say first time architects, but architects starting out and wanting to develop their skills in the area to apply it to something small um, and, and easily understandable. Um, so if you then look at my journey to find a simple case study, this was long and arduous. Um, I, oh my God, let me, I think I did my foundation, yeah, a long time ago. And then I did my advanced for which I'm writing this exam paper, I think in, oh dear, start of 2019. <laughs> um, so, um, and, and, but the thing, it took me a while to get started because what I was really struggling with was this case study. Like I remember David saying, you know, you can only do your case study if you actually apply the knowledge you've gained to a scenario. If you don't apply it, it, it won't be a good, exam paper. Um, so I was I was looking at my options and it turns out that for a consultant, this is not easy. So of course the first thought was, hmm, can I use some of my client work as a case study? Um, but this is difficult for confidentiality reasons. And also I typically run client projects that are you know between six months, a year maybe, but not enough to really get to know the company I'm working for on that level where I could just grab it and turn it into an architecture. Um, and then maybe Deloitte, like that's my own company, can't I use that as a case study? So of course this seems sensible, but it turns out that there's quite a strict division of information sharing between the consulting side of Deloitte and the internal information security department. Probably rightfully so, but I did not have the knowledge to build a case study out of my own company, which feels a little bit funny and is hopefully um, not the case for those of you who work in a line function. So then I started to look into fictional case studies. Um, and of course, I felt that something with an architecture flavor would be a great place to start. So I ended up at Tohoff and I actually have two very interesting case studies. I do recommend you to go and read them. Um, they have the Arc Assurance case study, which is I think around 50 pages, and then the Archimetal case study, um, which is a steel producing company, which is a little bit longer, 65 pages. Um, and this sets out kind of the enterprise architecture of these fictional organizations. So I figured this would be a really interesting basis for me to work from. And also it would be quite feasible um, because um, I, I don't know whether it's good or sad, uh, but none of these case studies mention security anywhere. Uh, if, you, if you try to find security as a word in these documents, I mean, 65 pages, people, um, it's not mentioned. There's an entire enterprise architecture in there that doesn't mention security. Um, then again, I, I imagine some of you might be saying in the chat right now, this is exactly how I experience it in real life. Um, well, me too, um, but still it was a great basis. So I actually started working from the Archimetal case study because the Arch Assurance one was very much around a business transformation, whereas the Archimetal one was a little bit more status quo. Um, and this was already a simplified representation of reality, right? So because it was fictional, it didn't have too many crazy details in there. And I figured it would be really good to just um, use this as a basis for answering my exam paper questions. Um, and I think at some point I was um, I was doing the SAPSA RMP and I, I think I got finally to the start of, of stage two. <laughs> um, and I realized I was already 20 pages in. <laughs> and, um, and I remember, um, so people saying like, Chris Blunt saying, no, no, good exam papers are short exam papers. And I figured that my 20 pages in, um, while I was not halfway or even on 10% was a very bad sign. Um, and then looking at some of the graphs and the tables I made and all the 
business attributes and security attributes that were in there. I thought this is simply, it's still too complex. It's still too complex, even though it's a fictional simplified thing. So we need something even simpler. And this is how we arrived at SA Bakery, um, which is fully fictional. Um, even the four security architects friends running the bakery are fully fictional. Um, so I thought of this scenario where four security architect friends meet at a local conference and they decide, you know, the conference scene isn't doing that well nowadays. It's all virtual, I've heard. So they decided to open a bakery in Kilishi, Ireland. Um, it's very close to Nas for those of you who might have been in the vicinity. And um, they are Matt, Sika, John and David. Any resemblance to actual persons is purely coincidental. Um, and so these, these four wonderful men, they decided to change careers and become bakers. Um, so this is, um, this is what the bakery looks like. Um, as you can see, it's on the, uh, on the road to Dublin, uh, only 40 kilometers away. And um, this is the store and uh, it's very simple. It's as simple as you can make baking bread. So we got David in the storefront. He's in charge of the display windows and the till. Um, and then John is in the kitchen. Um, we've got Matt who mans the storeroom and Sika is taking care of the office. Um, and so they're each in charge of the um, capabilities, the business processes in this part of the bakery. Um, and they're also responsible for basically everything that drives performance in this area. Um, they, they have a shared responsibility for the bakery as a whole. So it's a very collaborative process. Um, and then if we get to the SAPSA RMP, uh, so the road of baking bread is not for the faint hearted. Um, you can take the architect out of SAPSA, but not SAPSA out of the architect. So fortunately, Matt, Sika, John and David still know how to apply the SAPSA RMP. And um, this is basically what I've tried to do throughout my exam paper. So kind of keep up this front of, uh, of having a fictional case study um, and, um, and just making, David, Tika, John and Matt um, come up with risks and threats and opportunities of how they will tackle their bakery lives. Um, so for those of you that are not very familiar with the SAPS RMP, these are the well eight phases as I've described them. Um, so first of all, we're going to start with establishing the risk context and we're going to look at identifying the risks, assessing the risks, evaluating the risks. We will define risk treatment strategies and objectives, design risk control and enable strategies, and then we'll have a look at governance and communication and assurance. Um, as I mentioned before, we unfortunately won't be able to cover all of it, which is because I've gone into great detail on some of the earlier stages. Um, so I hope you'll appreciate that. Um, and that might mean that you'll um, force me to do a, a, a TSI webinar on the rest of it. I'd be happy to. Um, hopefully you... Um, you like the case study as we're developing a board game out of it. So it would be great if um, if we could develop this further into something that people can actually play and have fun with, not only virtually, but also physically. Um, so if I'm correct, there is a small poll question. Um, just wanting to get a sense of who of you have used a SAPSA RMP in a real life situation before. Um, now I can't see the poll, so it would be great if some of the one of the facilitators could let me know what the answers are. The poll is now live and the votes are being cast, Esther. It sounds very dramatic. It sounds like we're doing a Eurovision. We're doing it real <laughs> time, yeah. So we can tell you that the uh, the votes of the Kelsey jury in just a moment. Uh, it would appear that the question being, have you used the SAPS RMP in a real life situation before? Uh, top rated with jumping around 40 to 45 percent is no, but I do remember it from the SAMHSA training. At about 27 percent, we have I am clueless about this. Please show me how it's done. <laughs> 18, 19 percent say yes, I always use the SAMHSA RMP, and the minority of about 11 percent say I have used it once. Okay, interesting. So we've got quite a divided group there then. Um, so for me, I guess I've done a lot of risk assessments um, for companies and 
Um, I've used a variety of methodologies, but I've never applied the full SAPSA RMP to an organization. And actually seeing how much work this simplified, simplified case study was for me, um, I think it was very useful for me to do this in a simplified way before moving on to a bigger real life organization. So hopefully, if anything, this presentation will help you do the same. Again, don't copy and paste it because that will make it absolutely useless for your clients or your organization. Um, hopefully we can get to a little bit better understanding what the deliverables are in the SAPS RMP and what they could possibly look like for you. Um, so let's move into phase one, establishing the risk context. Um, so this is um, so SA Bakery and their goal is to be the go-to bakery for the inhabitants of Kilashi. It's very ambitious. Um, as we all know that Kiloshi is a very prestigious place um, and their objective as any good bakery is to maximize bakery profits. So um, this is a visualization of their business model where they of course look into, okay, if we want to maximize bakery profits, we need to look at our revenue side and our cost side. So the revenue side is driven by the number of customers, euro spent per visit and the frequency of visits. And these three things are driven by five factors below that quality, price, marketing, loyalty, and novelty. Then if we look at the cost, uh, we have fixed costs of running the bakery. So this is the building, staff, utilities, equipment, um, licensing and administration. And then we've got variable costs per bread. So it also means the more bread we sell, the more variable costs we make. Um, this is split up into time, staff, spent, ingredient costs, transaction fees, waste, and packaging. Um, if there are any people who run a proper bakery in this audience, um, I, I, I don't know that much about bakeries. So this is based on assumptions. And um, if you do run a bakery, please contact me so I can make my bakery security architecture game as realistic as possible. Um, then of course, when we are establishing the risk context, we also need to set some assumptions. So these are things that we assume to be true before we start analyzing the risk context and the security requirements. Um, so first of all, um, this bakery is a local Irish company. And this means that all the bakery processes take place within their physical location in Kilashi. Um, they only work with the best ingredients. So procurement of ingredients is done via an external supplier. They were voted the best bakery of Kildare in 2019. Um, and Kilashi inhabitants have a good appreciation of quality. So the better the bread, the more willing they are to buy um, with Snap's SA Bakery and even pay more for it. So the quality, uh, the revenue becomes a function of the quality of our bread. Um, they also say that innovation is in their DNA uh, and they found that Kilishi inhabitants will frequent the bakery more often if there are new products in the storefront because they want to try them out. And lastly, their clients love them. So um, Kilishi inhabitants' loyalty to the bakery can be increased through a loyalty scheme, um, and this will raise spend per visit and the frequency of visits. Such a scheme is currently not in place and could be something that we consider for our bakery. Now, if we look at the stakeholders, so usually in the SAP and RMP, we draw up a picture of who are the stakeholders. Again, I've kept it nice and simple here. So we've got four stakeholders. Um, you've already met them. These are the four, um, our four security architect friends now turned baker, and each of them is the domain owner and they're in charge of a specific subdomain. Um, they also have an associated capability. So um, again, very simplified, each of their domains runs one business process. And that process um, has three attributes associated to it. Um, so you can see them here in light gray. Um, and these are, of course, um, well, I, I've, I thought of things which I found representative for a bakery. I'm not gonna say they're complete. The um, goal of the exercise was to keep it as simple as possible. So each of them gets three attributes. Um, they're in charge of those attributes. They're in charge of the business process. Um, and one of the things that we do when we look at business attributes is we try and draft up a taxonomy. So this is simply saying, what is the attribute and how do we define it? And I think uh, I, I remember David stressing it so much during the course is it's very important to clearly define your attributes. If it doesn't have a definition, it will start to mean different things for different people, which is very undesirable when you're especially trying to uh, establish whether you're doing the right things and how you're performing on those attributes. Um, so here's the definition. 
I will, we will not go through all of them. You're happy to look at my slides later on and um, see whether you agree with them. Uh, but there are a lot about baking. Um, I think for me, the most interesting one was something around, um, I guess, things like tasty. So I know we, we are usually, we are thinking in security attributes. So you've got all the, the common things like available and timely and private. Um, so that's what I really liked about doing this is, is applying the concept of attributes to something which um, felt very not business of not security like. So we've got tasty, which I've tried to define as good as I could, but it, it, it felt like a very funny thing to do to make attributes out of these qualities. Oh, um, that is not where I wanted to go. Just a second. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, um, and then the next thing is not really any SAP to RMP, but it is something that I found interesting to do. So um, I already mentioned that um, each of the capabilities had three of their own attributes, um, but it did feel that there was a relation between some of these attributes. So I kind of done an attribute interaction map um, to see which attributes influence other attributes, because that would then, especially in a game context, um, it would mean that if somebody didn't perform on an attribute, that would influence the status of the other attributes. Um, so for instance, if you look at the, um, the attribute fresh, if the ingredients are not fresh, then it will impact tasty. So our bread won't be as tasty because our ingredients are not fresh. Um, and if we look at, uh, let me see, um, well, available. <laughs> so available has a lot of relationships to it, but um, it has a relationship to ordered because if we haven't ordered the ingredients, they won't be available for us later on. And if they haven't been delivered, they won't be available either. Uh, availability, of course, influences tasty because if we haven't got the ingredients we need, then we won't be able to produce bread and therefore the bread will not be tasty or we will be making bread without flour and, and that will make it very weird. We will be making pizza, I don't know. <laughs> um, so actually, so based of that, the Raki matrix is a, a common part of the SAPSA RMP. Um, SAPSA also knows additional roles, again, because I have such a simplified case study. I only felt it necessary to use the traditional A R I R A C I. Um, and what I've done is I've used the relationships from the previous slide to determine who is accountable, responsible, and consulted and informed um, for which of the attributes. Um, so I found that a very useful way of, of informing who should be involved in delivering on a certain attribute. Um, and then the next step in the process is to look at uh, risks. So we got, uh, here we've got the external risk taxonomy. Again, I tried to keep it simple. So I've gone for four different types of risks. And then I've put three types of risks in each of the buckets. Um, and then below you see an example of uh, me having taken three event types. Um, so I've taken customer demand, raw material delivery and technology developments. And we use the pest limb analysis in the SAPS RMP. Um, so you see that link there and for each one of them. So I, I am a big fan of doing risk analysis that both look at negative risk and a positive risk. I do recognize that it's very difficult because they're so ingrained in thinking in, in negative risk as security professionals. So I do feel it's, it's difficult to <laughs> think in opportunities and think in, in, in strengths when it comes to security. But that was why um, doing this case study was also so refreshing because it could take it out of the traditional context that I was used to and just apply it to a bakery. So you see some examples here, which are a little bit silly. Um, so if you look at the customer demand threat, some of our customers become more health conscious and buy less and less bread, which we of course hate. But an opportunity is that they appreciate artisan bread more. Um, and if we start um, doing more and more of that and more successfully, then the patronage as at SA Bakery might actually increase over time. Um, so this is an example of the internal context analysis. Again, I 
just taken three categories, people, processes, and technology. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with that triad um, and some uh, event types. Um, and here, so because it's internal, we now work with weaknesses and strengths, whereas external uses as threat and opportunity. So we've got your nice SWOT analysis there. Um, and so for each of these, we've got weaknesses and strengths. Um, and again, I find it really fun to do this for a bakery. So for instance, if we look at product quality, the ingredients from our new supplier produce lower quality bread, the current recipe, which is totally a thing I can imagine happening. Um, but if we look at the strength, then David is very proud of his new display because it shows off the product quality of the bread excellently. And this will drive customers to our store to buy our beautiful bread. Um, so if we get to the full SWOT analysis, then um, you see that I've taken a couple of threats and opportunities. I've put them in, so you see the description there, and we map them to strengths and weaknesses and to enablement drivers and control drivers. Um, so you can see how we can use some of that to create um, mitigations, or we can try to use our strengths to exploit an opportunity. Um, and so this is a start of how you can look at strategies of actually uh, working with your negative and positive risks. So if we go to the second phase, identifying risks, then first of all, we start with business drivers. Um, so here are four business drivers that I've come up with, enable trusted environments within the bakery where only the intended persons can enter and interact with bakery assets, ensure the information used in the bakery's operation is protected from alteration and protect the materials, goods, and assets of the bakery against compromise, um, and then have only those with the right privileges access and interact with the bakery's funds. Um, and what I really like about this, so we're, we're now getting into the proper security bit, I guess, is um, I, I know some people who say that security architecture is really for large organizations, and um, you know that you should start on it when you're relatively mature. Uh, but I think this is this case study is such a nice example of exactly how the bakery on the corner can make use of security architecture. And even these very simple things can be captured in a way that isn't necessarily bulky or heavy or will take you half a year to produce, but the same way of thinking works for this super tiny bakery. Um, and I, yeah, so that's my hope actually, that we can also let go of that way of thinking that security architecture is something that only mature and big companies should do, but actually the SAPS way of thinking is applicable to so many different things. Um, so I've tried to live it myself. I've, um, <laughs> I've linked our four business drivers to four security attributes, again, because as you'll see to the next slides, the more, the more you have, the bigger the tables become. Um, and I think this is one of the real issues I've had with my real life work sometimes. So I've kept it nice and small. So these are our four security attributes for today. Uh, again, you see them here with your definition. So this is our taxonomy. Um, and then I'll try to map them to security, um, to business attributes. So you see the four security attributes here in dark green, and then I've mapped them back to each of the business attributes in dark blue, um, and you'll see the processes, the capabilities in gray. Um, now I, I've, I've gone a little wild with this. So for the sake of our game, I'd make sure that um, every security attribute is mapped to a business attribute. Um, otherwise, people could get away with not actually investing in a certain attribute in the game. Um, and then we move on to threats and opportunities. Um, so these are some examples of threats and opportunities. I love my example of the raccoons. Um, so our raccoons break into the bakery at night via an open window and ransack the kitchen and storage looking for food. Um, I'm not sure whether this is a realistic problem for bakeries all around the world. I don't think we'll see this anytime soon in the Netherlands. Um, but I got a lovely picture of a raccoon from Jason the other day. Um, so I'm sure it's possible somewhere. Uh, but then again, so children who visit the bakery for a birthday party are left unsupervised. They play around with the oven and break it. There are some unusual threats and opportunities, but I think these are some of the things that, um, that bakeries could be thinking about in terms of threats and opportunities. Um, and then, of course, we can map them to our strengths and weaknesses. So we, we defined our strengths and weaknesses before, and we see that for some of these threats, we actually have a strength that mitigates that. Um, and, but in some cases, we have a weakness that could make the threat even worse. 
Um, and in some cases, we have nothing. So T4, um, there's Sika is ill and can't order ingredients. We don't have the strength or weakness to support or uh, make that worse. Um, we did the same for opportunities. Um, so here again, you see that there's not actually that many strengths and weaknesses. This is, of course, also a function of me trying to limit um, the number of things I've got. Um, so, but at least that keeps this table nice and simple. And then um, let's take an example. So um, let's look at this raccoon who has managed to sneak into a bakery to steal croissant. Um, and this is a threat to the security attribute access control. And we fortunately have a strength to remedy this. So we actually have a dedicated closed off and clean space for our ingredients, helping our organization and freshness. Um, so complicated slide. To the left, we've got inherent risk. So what I've done is I've taken our business drivers. This is basically the first slide I showed you with the business model. Um, <laughs> I've taken the revenue drivers, variable cost drivers, and fixed cost drivers as my business drivers. Then I've taken the business attributes that I've, I've shown you before and the security attributes that we talked about just now. And if you look at this particular thread, um, then in green, we see the elements that uh, might be slightly improved. And in red, we see the elements negatively impacted if this were to occur. Um, so you see quite a lot of red. Um, and finally, I saw I've made marketing green because I figured it would be a really good story for the bakery if they could tell their clients that they've been ransacked by raccoons. Um, but other than that, I think the scenario is quite unlucky. And you see a lot of business attributes and business drivers are impacted in red. So if we then look at our strength, which is that we have a closed off space. So Matt is guarding the storage room and it's his responsibility. And he does that very well to make sure that there's no ingredients out there. Um, then we actually see that it's still a good story. So marketing is still in green. Um, and of course, our security attributes are still compromised, like they still got in, um, but um, most of the business attributes are fine because there were no ingredients out there. They were locked behind the door. The only thing is that the bakery might no longer be clean because they are raccoons and they might leave traces in the kitchen. Uh, but other than that, the business attributes are great. And you also see then, if we look at the business drivers, that only two items are impacted. So maybe they've touched the equipment and the storefront and things are a mess because they are raccoons um, and our staff will spend some time cleaning their mess up. But other than that, our business attributes are not significantly impacted and we can still run our normal day. Um, it might make for a slightly less sensational story um, that the raccoons were unsuccessful, but still. Um, and here I wanted to show you um, uh, an opportunity, and this is an opportunity that did not have a strength or weakness attached to it. But this is the opportunity around through exact record keeping, we can better predict customer demands and minimize waste due to overordering, um, where you see kind of the reverse pattern in green and in red. Um, so yes, exact record keeping is not great because our staff needs to spend time and we need to pay administration costs for record keeping. But other than that, uh, our business attributes are in green um, because we have more control over what we order, there's less waste, um, it will drive our variable costs down. Um, and because we can better estimate what people want to have, we can better than um, think of novel breads that we want to produce, which will satisfy customer demand. So moving into phase three. Um, so we talked about the attribute taxonomy before, which is just the attribute and the definition of what it is, which you see in the first column here. Um, and the attribute profile adds to that a measurement approach metric and performance target. And for the measurement approach, I've, I've added something myself. So I've gone with description design and effectiveness measurements. Um, basically description is, um, do we have a good plan? Uh, design is how have we implemented that plan? How is the control itself working? And effectiveness is, is the control working well? So how effective is the control? Um, and then you'll see the metric, which is the way that we use to express um, what we find in the measurement approach. And then we've got our performance targets. This is what we want to strive for. Now, SAP's RMP works with two thresholds. We've got the secondary threshold and the primary threshold. And the secondary threshold is kind of your early warning signal. So this is something that you would like to be notified of because it signals that something is going in the wrong direction, but it, it doesn't significantly worry you, yes? Whereas your primary threshold is your critical threshold where you really should be taking action. Um, 
So this is kind of fun to think of what it would be for a small bakery. I, I think maybe real bakers would have different thresholds and performance targets, but it was a challenge in itself to find my inner baker and um, see what things I would find appropriate if I were running a bakery. Um, so there is more attributes here. I'm just going to show them quite quickly to you um, as a way of showing you the different types of metrics and performance targets that I've gone for. Um, I found it very difficult to... Um, so for instance, if we look at the 1.4 effectiveness, uh, if we look at the ingredients, um, I was like, when would it be a problem? So I, I've, I've looked into peripheral ingredients and core ingredients. Um, and I, I tried to make it work, but it's, it's a very interesting thing to think about a domain which you're not that knowledgeable about. I feel like I should start my own bakery now just to compensate for it. Um, then we've got uncompromised here. Um, so this this already looks a little bit more like the traditional security stuff that you would expect, wouldn't it? So it's very much around authorizations and unauthorized access. Um, and then the last one, well, this is authorized, also around authorizations and authorized access. So the difference between these two is um, this is around um, having access to things in the bakery, whereas the last one, authorized, and this is, again, this is in the definition, because if I just said authorized, you wouldn't know what I meant. It could mean anything. But I've actually split this up into access to things in the bakery um, and, and the potential impact that that could have on our bakery assets and the continuation of your business processes and authorized in the sense of our funds. So this one is specifically scoped around who can access the till and who can access the bank account because we're going to need that money to order new ingredients. And therefore also the, the risks associated with these attributes is very different. So the uncompromised one is actually mostly around business continuity. If something breaks, if something goes missing. And the other one is very much, well, it's also around business continuity, but it's very much about if we don't have money, um, we can't survive, we can't buy ingredients. Um, so that's why there's two different ones, even though, uh, in, you know, when you just hear the attribute, they might sound quite similar. So then we're going to go to risk maps. Um, I know Richard is in the audience. He might recognize some of this. I reused and reproved, uh, improved it, Richard. Um, so uh, this is a negative risk map. And I've also got a positive risk map for you. So basically, we first look at likelihood, which I've kept simple again on three levels. So we've got the threat level on the vertical axis and the vulnerability level on the horizontal axis. And you see the definitions below, um, which are quite generic in a way. Um, and you see that the likelihood table will be repeated on the next slide because we will be using this likelihood uh, for both negative risk and positive risk. So let's look at the slightly more interesting one to the right then. So this is around impact, where we've taken the results um, from the uh, likelihood matrix. So first we determine the likelihood of an event. Um, and this is now on the vertical axis. And then on the horizontal axis, you have the business impact with minor, major, and severe. Um, I found business impact actually really difficult to determine for a bakery. I wasn't, so I've split it up into it's either a significant part of weekly profits, quarterly profits, or yearly profits. Um, I recognize there, there are also some impacts which don't have to do with profits, like reputation damage, um, but I found it very difficult to make this into a comprehensive definition. So there you go. This is the best I could think of. Um, and then, of course, the thing that we're interested in is overall risk, since this is kind of, this is our risk matrix, if you will. So where does the risk in the end sit if we take into account its likelihood and its business impact? So I've done the same for positive risk. Uh, again, to your left is exactly the same thing as what we had. To the right, we've got positive impact. Uh, oh, I see the... So this should be minor, major, and super, not severe. Um, it's super. Um, and this is basically the exact opposite of what you just saw for the negative impact. Um, and then a risk register, which I think is a really complicated thing. I have seen many risk registers in my life. And um, basically, I think most of them are terrible. I'm not sure whether this one is great. Um, <laughs> But um, I think it also really depends on your organization on how you want to make things work. So what I've done here is I've taken the risk reference to the right. I've mentioned the risk and then the risk owner, which is Matt because he owns the store. Um, and I've taken the example of our raccoons breaking into the bakery. So this is just one threat or opportunity. 
Um, I've then listed the security attributes impacted and the inherent business attributes impacted. So if we were to do nothing, so this is like the leftmost scenario that I showed you earlier. If we look at the inherent risk, these are inherently, if we don't do anything about it, the business attributes that will be impacted. Um, then I've assigned a likelihood, which I thought was medium, like it's possible, um, but I wouldn't say it, it happens frequently, depending on where your bakery is. Um, and the impact, I think, is quite minor. Um, so the inherent risk rating I then gave it was a medium. Then if we look at the strengths and weaknesses, so we actually found that we do have a strength for this specific threat. Namely, we have a dedicated closed off and clean space for our ingredients. Um, so still the security attributes are impacted because the raccoons might still get in. Um, and most of the business attributes are uh, not impacted. So what I showed you previously, only clean remains as we still likely need to clean up the bakery. Um, the likelihood is still the same, so they still might break in, but in this case, the impact has gone to none because all the ingredients are locked into the stored room, so they're absolutely fine. So the reduced risk rating becomes none. And then the question is, is it even worth to consider additional controls that you need to put in place to mitigate against the threat? I mean, yeah, the re reduced risk rating is already none, but um, I figured it wouldn't be a complete example if I didn't give you this. So. Um, I tried my best. I did put them at low priority in my need column though. Um, we've got an enablement and control owner for one of it is still again, Matt, and the other one is now John. Uh, I said they're both implemented. Um, and in this case, um, John is responsible for ensuring no food items from the kitchen remain outside of storage at the end of the day. And uh, Matt is responsible for locking all points of entry to the storeroom at the end of the day. Um, and in this case, this actually makes sure that the raccoons probably won't be able to get in. And so we um, remove the security attributes, access controlled and unauthorized from our impacted list. Um, we still need to clean. <laughs> um, and if you then look at the likelihood and the impact, they've both got reduced to none. And so our risk residual, residual risk rating has also gone to none. Um, so this is just one example, and I realized it looks quite big. I'm not sure whether I would do it like this in practice, um, but I felt this was, for this specific threat, a nice and comprehensive way of visualizing it. I'm not sure what I would actually do if I had like, I don't know, 25 attributes, um, 25 threats, whether this would be the way to go or um, whether I would choose something else. Um, and then we've got our risk heat map. So you'll uh, recognize again that we've got the, um, the business impact and we've got our positive risk on the left and our negative risk on the right. And so an example of what it would look like if you would follow through the different stages of the risk register is that for instance, our negative risks start out here and then um, they move here in dark gray once we've applied our strengths and our weaknesses to it. And then for instance, once we've also applied additional additional control or enablement strategies um, is they end up somewhere, um, well, in, in the case of the negative risk, hopefully uh, with a low business impact and a low likelihood. And of course, for the positive risks, we try to maximize the likelihood and maximize the business impact. Um, so I, <laughs> I've run to that quite quickly. Um, I hope you enjoyed seeing my train of thought in approaching this for my exam paper. I must say, even with a simplified case study, I still found it a lot of work, but I found it very enjoyable to do. Um, and I just wanted to give you a glimpse of, of how I've structured it, because I know that lots of people do the advanced trainings, but then again, lots of people struggle with actually writing their exam papers. And I really wish um, that we could help those people a little bit better. So that's also why I wanted to present on this today in an effort to inspire some of you to uh, pick up or continue writing your exam papers. And we can all strive to be practitioners and masters one day altogether. Um, so the last question I had today was, um, would you like to see phase four and uh, through eight in, for instance, a um, SAPSA Institute webinar? I happen to be involved in those, so I should probably get myself on the schedule if you want to. Um, but this is just a question. So maybe you think I've had enough or uh, maybe you wanna know more or you wanna know more in a different way. Um, there should be a poll somewhere around there. And uh, maybe David can enlighten us on the scores. Certainly, Esther. Thank you very much. So the poll is now live um, and it's jumping around a little bit. 
but we have around 45% saying, yes, that would be super. Please turn it into a webinar. It's actually increasing as I speak. Um, just turn the entire thing into a TSI publications at about 25%. What is a TSI webinar is 12%. Um, and no thanks, I'm good is 3%. Cool, 3%. To that. Yeah. So um, interestingly, I think you should start by explaining what a TSI webinar is, given that a significant percentage of people don't know. Yeah, of course. Um, so the TSI webinar is something that I run together with James from the TSI, uh, from the Samson Institute. We try and do one every month. Um, we usually get people from the SAMHSA community to speak on a topic that they really like. So usually this is either a session that they've done before at COSEC or something that they've brought in from their work and they want to present on and share with the community. So um, we have a session like we have today, which usually lasts an hour and people get to ask lots of questions because we try to do it interactively, engagingly like COSEC would be. Um, and everybody can watch it. So um, you just need to keep a close watch of the um, SACS Institute social media accounts where they will be announced. And then the recording is accessible for members on the SACS Institute website. And if you want to do a webinar, contact me because <laughs> we're always looking for new speakers. And Esther is in charge of webinar schedule. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm the webinar boss. Um, okay. Let's start with Uh, Mr. Hirschfeld is coming on stage now. Um, Michael, I, you have audio but no visual, is that correct? Uh, I should have video. Can you hear me? I can hear you, so go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, so, Michael. Um, Esther, that was fantastic. SABSA can be used for, for big systems of systems, complex problems, big audacious hairy goals, as well as putting out immediate bushfires helping out small startups, delivering quick and dirty solutions. Your work seems to range from small to big, real life, daunting and complex tasks. How do you select the best tools, SABSA or otherwise, to progress your problem analysis and design thinking in that broad range of situations? Where do you start? The I feel like metrics. we need to get Rosanna back in. Yeah. <laughs> Am I fully qualified to answer this question or do I need my co-host? Yeah. Um, I think no, you're no, almost, I yeah. <laughs> I would say, um, I would say, uh, really, um, um, yes, I do mostly work for very large corporations and, and I've always found it to be very daunting. I think the best way is to, to cut it up into pieces, um, but sometimes you find that it's really difficult. So what I described in my presentation was starting from the contextual layer and thinking that what you have is actually quite small. And then when you move down the layers of SAPSA, uh, it becomes bigger and bigger. I think the trick is then to make sure to scope with the organization that you're working for, that you will go down one specific pillar in the, um, in the SAPSA model. Um, so take a, a specific small um, issue you're working on or a small solution um, and, and architect through that. Because what I've seen is that some parties have tried to do SAPSA over the entire organization in one go. So moving from the contextual layer, doing that for the entire organization and then moving layer and layer down for the entire organization. And that is just a, um, that is just a, a process that will take forever and will lose you the support of whoever is supporting your security architecture work. Um, so the design thinking I bring to it is how can we cut this up into small pieces that will allow me to quickly prove my success as an architect um, and will basically get people impressed enough to allow me to move on with other parts of the architecture. I hope That's that right. answers your question. <laughs> I think so. Thank you, Michael, and thanks for the answer, Esther. Uh, we have another question from Rahul, who's still awake. It looks like all of our primary <laughs> questions are coming from the middle of the night in Australia. I was going to say Rahul. <laughs> so Rahul asks, how did you lock, it's a very practical question, how did you lock down the questions to answer? Did you end up answering the same two questions that you started with? Uh, you mean for the exam paper? I think that's what he means, yeah. Right. Um... I spent a significant amount of time trying to understand the exam questions themselves and what was expected from me. Um, so I would also be happy to share this with somebody else, but I, um, I, I actually 
have a section in my paper at the start of it where I break down the question in great detail and what is expected from me. And then I structured my exam paper with those specific deliverables. Um, so it's I, I, I broke it down a lot. Again, I'm all about breaking down problems, it seems. I cut it up into the smallest possible chunks. And I did this in order to keep myself from diverting. So my first attempt, what I described with the Archimedo case and being 20 pages in, I realized that I, I had already digressed probably too much from what was expected from me to give a good exam paper answer. Interesting answer. Um, next question require, comes with a health warning, Esther. So bear in mind that most of the SABSA examiners are in fact online at this moment. Uh, the question from Rob Campbell is, did you pass? I have not submitted it yet, Rob. So um, no, I don't know, video. Rob. A very brave person who shows their exam paper to their examiners before submitting the paper. <laughs> well, I hope that they will give me some subtle validation points after this session. Um, maybe that's what I'm uh, what I'm on about. No, so this came, of course. Um, I mentioned that I was developing the board game as well for my COSEC session, um, and and we decided to do it around the same case study when I felt my archimedal case study wasn't really. Um, well, going the way it should be going, so that's when I switched to the essay bakery session. Um, case study. Um, so I haven't submitted it yet. I ideally would like this case, I use this case study for all of my papers and then benefit from the work that I've done uh, on the first paper to make it really easy to do the three other papers. Um, so this is my secret plan. And um, and I just hope the theme makes it interesting enough for examiners to kind of uh, forget anything serious being said about Samson in the actual paper. They'll they'll just be thinking about croissant. That's called bribery. Um, strategy, strategy. strategy. Uh, Praminder Singh uh, asks: Is the impact lowered due to strengths, or do strengths lower only the likelihood? Um, and Andy Clark has posted a sub comment saying, please see yesterday's discussion on dependency modeling. And it would be interesting to hear your view on this, which of course is the point in asking you the question. So mm, very good. Um, so I think that most strengths and weaknesses will have an impact on either likelihood or impact. I think it's unlikely to have a strength or weakness that does both. Um, so typically I think that's what happens. So. Um, I wouldn't say it's either or, but um, a specific strength is likely to influence a likelihood or an impact. Um, I'm not, I, I was at the dependency modeling session, but I'm not sure what they said there. So I hope I'm not contradicting Andy. <laughs> For what it's worth, my view is strength or weakness affects probability. But there we go. Um, John O'Leary. Esther, will the bakery be opening a subsidiary in Plano, Texas? Here we have raccoons, opossums, and armadillos. Yeah, I was actually thinking that this is not as likely in Ireland, um, but then again, I'm not Irish, so I don't want to. I don't want to pretend I know about the problems of the Irish people either. Um, but um, yeah, maybe maybe David, Zika, John, and Matt should go to Texas. Um, I would like to currently blank out the chat where people are trying to. Um, advise the world on whether or not they are in fact your markers, which is supposed to be anonymous. <laughs> um, final question is from Noor. Uh, oh, is Noor coming on stage? No, I'll ask it myself. Uh, are there any particular indicators you notice and flag when you break down problems you address in large corporations? Um, oh, that's a difficult last question, that. Huh? Um, can you repeat it, David? Yep. Noor asks, oh, um, are there any particular flags that or indicators you notice in large corporations? Um, when breaking down problems, right? So I think one of the most frequent flags that worry me when I'm breaking down a problem is if people have tried to solve the problem many times before I'm trying to solve it, um, and that either means that the people before me were not as good as I at problem solving, which is an option, um, but it's more likely that somebody is hiding a part of the truth, which I will not have access to either, which is preventing me from solving the problem well. Um, 
So I usually try to counter that by, um, of course, gaining the trust of the people that I work with, but that is more easily said than done. Um, I think it's also around presenting different options and then testing how people respond to those options, which might give you a little bit more insight around what the hidden information is about. But, you know, as a consultant, I usually get brought in for things that many people have failed at before. And it's um, a very daunting task to not try and fail the same way that people before me have failed. I mean, that's not they're paying me to not fail. So I better find a way to not fail. OK, thank you very much indeed, Esther. I uh, appreciate your honesty and answering all of the questions as well, um, not to mention your bravery in exposing your exam work before it was marked. Uh, so thank you very much. I think, it's in the uh, trend of uh, COSEC session. So I always try to bring something that I have no confidence in whatsoever that it's absolutely correct and then see if people shoot it down. So it's good COSEC practice. I think we would have loved to have had the board game uh, here in person as well to bring the whole thing to life. But certainly I was watching the, the chat window when there were a lot of, of positive comments that you couldn't see about that being helpful. So thank you very much indeed, Esther. Uh, for everyone else, we're uh, about to go to the green room and take our brilliant next speaker, Lisa Lorenzen, onto the stage. So you will once again see the uh, speaker getting ready message across your screen, and we'll be back with you momentarily.